Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, starting with verse number 11. Verse number 11, this is sermon number 22. We've been now about six months, we started in the midpoint of January in the Revelation, so we're over halfway. So we've been studying now six months, and I hope that this study has been uh, as exciting to you as it is to me, as I learn more and more about God's Word, especially with, I've always been fascinated fascinated with the end time and what's going to transpire. Everyone standing, Revelation chapter 13, starting with verse 11. Everyone, will, with your Bibles open, read with me. Uh, as I read aloud, read along with me in your Bibles silently. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And it says, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns, two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image, the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause it should speak and caused that as many as would not worship the beast, the beast image, the image of the beast should be killed. And he calleth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Six, six, six. Let us pray. Father God, we, we come now this morning just thanking you just for another day's journey. Father, we thank you for waking us up and starting us on our way. So we come now this morning just to magnify your name because your name is above every name. So, Father, we're just so thankful that you've given us life, health, and strength. You allowed us to be in this number just one more time. So, Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for your love for us, your dying love that you sent your son down through 42 generations, that he would die on an old rugged cross just so we can have life and have it more abundantly. Father, we thank you for your word and the power that's in your word. You said it is the power unto salvation. You say your word will go forth and not return void. So, Father God, I pray now that you would give your people an ear to hear and a heart to heed as to what thus saith the Spirit of God, that we not only be hearers of the word, but we be doers as well, that we take that which we learn, apply to our lives, and help us to be better today than we were yesterday. So, Father, now we come to the point of the service where we break the bread of life. And I pray now that you will lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom. You will anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. You will give me preaching power from on high that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase, that they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you and thank you, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord as we continue our series of sermons in the book of the Revelation that I've entitled Unlocking the Future. This is part 22, but I want to use for a subject this morning, Satan's counterfeit substitute. Satan's counterfeit Satan's counterfeit substitute as we continue our study in the 
in Revelation 13, as we continue to study in the book of the Revelation, we looked at chapter 1, Jesus unveils chapters 2 and 3, Jesus in the church, chapters 4 and 5, Jesus on the throne, chapter 6 through 18, Jesus in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 19, Jesus in his return, chapter 20, Jesus in the millennial reign, chapter 21, Jesus in heaven, and finally, chapter 22, we see Jesus in all of eternity. Listen very carefully. A lot of folks today think that we are in the tribulation now. This is not the tribulation. If they knew their Bibles or if they knew what the Bible says, you would understand that we are not in the tribulation period. A lot of folks today, believe it or not, they are gathering rations. Uh, that simply means they're getting the canned food that does not expire for 75, 80, 100 years. They're storing it up so when the tribulation comes, they'll be able to eat. People are actually building bunkers up under the ground so when this nuclear fallout happens, so whenever it happens, they'll have a place to go underground and be able to stay underground for the scriptures say seven years, but at least 21 years. So they're building the bunkers so they can go up underground for 21 years and they have enough food to last them for, for, for even 100 years. Only thing you have to do is open up a can, add water, poof. And the food simply blows up. People have the mindset that we're in the tribulation or that we're even going through the tribulation. But when we look at Revelation chapter 1, 10, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 10, verse 10 as well, it says that we shall not go through the thumas, the wrath of God, the child of God, shall not go through the tribulation. Let me let you know how I know we're not in the tribulation because you're looking at me. Amen. Now, as long as I'm here, I can only speak for myself. As long as I'm here, you know we're not in the tribulation. If one day you come in and the well, pastor's not here today, then guess what? You were left behind. And everybody else is going. But listen, the child of God, the rapture of the church has to occur first before the tribulation begins. So as long as the church and the child of God is still here, we are not in the tribulation. Now, I know we are going through tribulation. That simply means problems and trials and difficulties of life that we are going through. But this is not the tribulation. Amen. A lot of folks saying that we're going through it, but the child of God, we said yes to Jesus Christ and Jesus has died on the cross and all of our sins have been removed. Therefore, if we went through the judgment of God, that's what you call double jeopardy. Amen. We've already been saved from it, but then it would be wrong if God make us go through it if we've already been saved from it. That's double jeopardy, but listen very carefully. But we should have a seriousness about worship today. A seriousness. That means we need to forego all of this entertainment. We need to forego all of this dumbing down of the preaching. We need more preaching. and We have more churches than we've ever had, but then we have more crime. I don't understand how the churches are going up and the crime is going up too. It all to seem to me that the more churches you have, the less crime it ought to be because if you're preaching and teaching the word of God, hearts and lives are changed. A man has repented and they have changed their direction. Seems like crime will go down. But it appears to me that the churches are not really preaching the word of God, but there ought to be a seriousness about the word of God today. Paul says we're living in the last days and in the last and evil days in most churches simply are just having church as usual without God. They simply having program after program, this and that. They're having a rap contest and everything. Just because you go to church don't mean that you're worshiping God. Yeah. The last time I remember Genesis chapter 2, when worship was first given, there was no church, there was no sermon, there was no pastor, there was no deacon, there was no member. It was simply a man in God. So worship has absolutely nothing to do with the building. It has all to do with your, with, with your relationship with God. Amen. That's what worship is. The state of mind of your, your heart, the conditioning of your heart. That is worship. Just because you come into a building does not make you a part of the organism just because you're part of the organization, because last time I checked, ain't nail brick going to heaven. Yeah. So you can come to church all you want. That don't mean that, you, that you're worshiping God. But many folks come to church, but the church is not in you. You remember Cain and Abel? They both worship. They both brought a sacrifice. 
One was accepted and one was not. That simply means that you can have worship and your worship is not accepted by God. Amen. All you have to do is just look around at some of the churches today. They're having church and Jesus is on the outside knocking, trying to, to get in. But we need to be serious about worship. And this is the reason why we need to be serious about worship. Because the one thing that Satan has always desired is to be worshipped by humanity. Yeah. He wants to be worshipped. Therefore, we need to be serious about worship. From the beginning of time, he always wanted to be worshipped. Here we find in chapters 13, we find the, uh, the total epitome of evil in the unholy trinity, which we find Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. This is the unholy trinity or the satanic trinity. It is the opposite of the divine trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan has always wanted to duplicate and imitate what God does. But I want to remind us that this false prophet, when he steps on the scene, he's going to cause others to worship the beast. He's going to seal them with a mark. And then he's going to cause them to follow the Antichrist, the beast. When we talk about the Antichrist, the first 10 verses, last week we dealt with the man that comes out of the sea, that is the sea of humanity, out of the population. He's going to be empowered by the dragon, Satan himself, and he's going to have great power, and he's going to do great wonders, and he's going to have total control of the 10 kingdoms during the tribulation period. Now I want to remind you, he's a man of peace. He's going to make a peace treaty. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says for one week and in the midst of the week he's going to break that peace treaty three and a half years into the tribulation. This Antichrist is going to break the peace treaty, sit in the temple and to and be demanded that he be worshipped as God. But I want us to notice now one of the most intriguing things in the Bible is the 666. The subject of the 666 in a lot of Folks, and I remember growing up watching the Omen. I don't know if you've seen it before, the first one when Damien and uh, she pulled back his hair and she saw the mark of the 666 on the side of his head long, many, many years ago. But there's a fascination with the 666. There's a fascination of what's going to happen throughout the tribulation, especially during this point in time of the tribulation. But I want you to understand that this false prophet his whole modus operandi, his MO, is to cause people not to worship himself, but to worship the beast, which is the Antichrist. When we study John chapter, chapter 16, verses 7 through 15, we notice that Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, one just like me. And his job is to cause people to follow Jesus Christ. So this is an imitation of everything that God has done. He's trying to imitate what God has done. But as we think on this subject, Satan, Superman, I want us to notice three things that I feel that would be an encouragement to us all. First of all, I want us to notice the dynamic monster reveal. The deceptive miracle recorded and the deadly mark that is received. Point number one, the demonic monster revealed in verses 11 and verse 12. But notice the description cited there in verse 11. And it says, and I beheld another beast come out of the earth. You remember in verse 1. It says there was a beast come out of the sea, the seat of humanity. But I want us to notice that John is the writer. And John is on the Isle of Patmos. And he's there because he refused to call the emperor God. Domitian wanted them to call him God. But John refused. And because of his standing and his principle standing for God and on God's word, he was banished to this Isle of Patmos, but I want us to notice under the description side, and notice first of all, I want us to notice the identity there. First of all, I want us to notice this beast is identical to the first one. And it says, and I beheld, that means to look intently, another beast. Now there's two words for the word another. There's alas and heteros. That's a different one. He said I, another here, alas, simply means another of the same kind. Let me give you the illustration that I'm giving throughout the years. 
and I see if I had a watch and my watch is broken and if I have a Rolex watch and I go to the jeweler and I say I want another watch but I want a watch just like the watch that I have I want another Rolex watch or I can say listen my watch is broken I want another watch, but I want one of a different kind. I don't want a Rolex. I want a Timex. So we got to understand this word alas simply means there's another beast just like the beast previously in verse 1. They have the same character, conduct, and characteristic. They are identical. He says, I see another beast, but this time this beast is coming out of the earth simply meaning through the Jewish nation. So one is coming out of the sea of humanity. And in verse 11, he says he's coming out of the earth, out of the Jewish nation. So he said, I see another beast. And this beast is identical to the first beast. He has the same conduct and the same characteristic as the first beast. He's just like the first beast. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, I'm going to send you another comforter. Allah, a comforter, one that's just like me. He didn't say I'm going to send you someone different from me. He didn't say I'm going to send you the false prophet or send you the Antichrist. He said I'm going to send you the third person of the Trinity. I'm going to send the, the Holy Spirit to you and he's going to be just like I am. Amen. The same characteristics yes. and the same conduct as him. But under the description cited we see first of all he's identical and first and secondly he's the uh, he likes to mimic uh, everything that God has done. Look at verse 11 again. And it says, and he had two horns like a lamb, but yet he spake like a dragon. He's an imitator. Notice the two horns simply means uh, power and authority. Now this second beast is identical to the first beast, but it says he has the same power and the same authority, just like the Antichrist. He's given his power from the dragon himself, from Satan himself.